Hello, fellow ink drinkers, and welcome back to the Blind Girls Book Talk podcast. Aria. And I'm Belle. And we are two legally blind sisters who love reading and love books. And so what we've done is we've created a show in order to talk about that. We cover a wide range of bookish topics, and that can range from bad retellings of stories, book to movie adaptation comparisons, buddy reads, recent reads, book theories, author talks, nostalgia reads, really, the list does go on. And today, what we're actually going to be covering is another one of our author talks, and we are going to be doing it about Lewis Carroll. Now, we chose this author because there's definitely been a lot of speculation and rumor around him and his life. And so I kind of wanted to do some research more on that and see... If it was accurate, if there was anything to these rumors and speculation, or if it was all just speculation. So, without further ado, I'm going to get into my research. Now, Belle, I will say there's one thing that I found out later that I'm kind of interested to see in if you know if this is true or not. Okay. Okay. So, Lewis... Wait, is this a test of my knowledge or... A bit. Oh, Oh, boy. Okay. A bit. So Lewis Carroll, his real name was Charles Ludwig, Ludwig Dodson, and he was born on January 27th, 1832 in Dansbury, Cheshire. And so he was the eldest son and third child in a family of seven girls and four boys who was born to Francis Jean Ludwig, the wife of Reverend Charles Dodson. He was born in a parsonage in Daresbury. His father was a curate there from 1827 until 1843 when he became the rector of Croft in Yorkshire. And that's a post that he held for the rest of his life. So the Dodson children lived an isolated country life, essentially, and they had very few friends outside the family. But like many other families in similar circumstances, they found little difficulty in entertaining themselves. Charles first showed a great aptitude for inventing games to amuse everybody. He had kind of a talent for imagination. When they moved to Croft when he was 12, it was the beginning of the rectory magazines. And this was a manuscript to which all of the family were supposed to contribute. And Charles wrote a lot of those editions, I guess, that survive, beginning with useful and instructive poetry and following with the rectory magazine and the rectory umbrella. And then he did attend the Richmond School in Yorkshire and then proceeded to rugby school. He disliked his four years at public school, principally because of his shyness, although he was also subjected to a certain amount of bullying. He endured some different illnesses, one of which left him deaf in one ear. And then after his time at rugby, he was tutored by his dad, and he matriculated to Christ Church, Oxford, and he went into residence as an undergraduate there. And so he excelled at mathematical and classical studies, and he was nominated for a studentship because of this. He gained a first in mathematical finals coming out at the head of the class, and he proceeded to have a bachelor's of arts degree in December of that same year. He was made a master of the house and had a senior student called a fellow in other colleges the following year and was appointed a lecturer in mathematics, which is essentially a tutor, a post he kept until he resigned in 1881. He held his studentship until the end of his life. As was the case with a lot of fellowships at the time, his time at Christchurch was dependent upon him remaining unmarried, and by the terms of this, he had to proceed to holy orders, so he became a deacon in the Church of England on December 22, 1861. Had he gone on to become a priest, he could have married and then would have been appointed to a parish, but he felt himself unsuited for parish work. And though he considered the possibility, he decided that he was perfectly content to remain a bachelor. 
So then it goes on to his association with children. And they said that this happened naturally because of his position, because he was the eldest son with eight younger brothers and sisters. He was used to dealing with younger kids. They said that he also had a stammer, which they referred a lot to as hesitation. And he never wholly overcame that. And by some accounts, he was only able to speak more naturally and easily to children, although the stammer varied in intensity by circumstance. So then while he was kind of, I think, in his fellowship and all of that, he began to entertain the children of Henry George Little, who was the dean of Christ Church. Alice Little and her sisters Lorena and Edith were not, of course, the first of his child friends. There were a bunch of other people that he had been friends with, but the little children held the highest place in his affections because they were the only children in Christ Church. What they would do is they would be escorted by the girls' governess, and the girls would come and visit Dodson in the college rooms. Alice later said that they used to sit with him, essentially, and that he would draw for them and told stories, and he would just make up a bunch of tales, and sometimes they were older, you know, stories that he had told before, but he would kind of tweak them a little bit. But they kind of grew into new tales and, and it was something that he did. On July 4th, 1862, Dodgen and his friend, Robinson Duckworth, rode the three children up the river from Oxford to Godstow and they picnicked and then they returned to Christ Church late in the evening. And on that trip is when he told them the fairy tale of Alice's adventures underground. And so after he told them that, he then decided to write it down. Much of the story was based on actual experience is when they were caught out in the rain. But that inspired him to tell this story. And so essentially, Alice kind of wanted to be the center of attention. And so Alice kind of said, you should you should write out her adventures for me to Dodgson. And so he did. So he wrote it all down and he illustrated with his own crude but distinctive drawings and gave the finished product to Alice Little. But then a novelist, while visiting the deanery, chanced to pick up the copy of this little manuscript from the drawing room table and read it. And he urged Mrs. Little to persuade the author to publish it. And this, of course, got back to Dodson, who was really surprised. And he asked one of his friends for advice. His friend took the manuscript and read it to his child, and pretty much his friend said that his kid wished that there were many, many more volumes of this story. And so he revised it. He cut out some more particular references to the previous picnic and added some additional stories, and then he found somebody who could draw the illustrations and then it was published as Alice's Adventure in Wonderland in 1865. The first edition was withdrawn because of bad printing and only about 21 copies survive. The book was slow but steadily increasing success and by the following year he was already considering a sequel based on more stories that he told the Littles and the result was Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found. By the time of Dodgson's death, Alice Taking the two volumes as a single artistic triumph had become the most popular children's book in England. This happened by 1932, and it was one of the most popular and perhaps the most famous in the world. Essentially, nobody knows why it became very popular, but it became very popular. In my research, it said that Lewis Carroll himself kind of became a riddle, and there were efforts to prove that his friendships with little girls were some sort of subconscious substitute for married life, that he showed symptoms of jealousy when his favorites came to tell him that they were engaged and that he contemplated marriage with some of them, most notably with Alice Little, but there's no evidence to back this up. He dropped the acquaintance of Alice Little when she was 12, as he did with most of his young friends. And then... He also was remembered as a fine photographer of children and of adults as well. 
but he had an early ambition to be an artist, which he failed at, so he turned to photography. He eventually abandoned that hobby, and we'll talk more about this later. Essentially, he then started publishing not only the Alice things under the the Lewis Carroll pen name, but also some other poems and other stories. And some of the stuff that he ended up trying to write later just really failed. He kind of hit it off with Alice. He tried to go back to that and it kind of failed, essentially. So now we go back to the pictures. And essentially, I should give a warning because... Some people might be triggered by this, but according to what I found, there might be logical explanations for the, all of this. So just a trigger warning. Essentially, like I said before, he liked to take photographs and half of the pictures that he had taken were of children. OK, 30 of whom were depicted as nude or semi nude. Now, some of these portraits might shock us today, obviously. Because all of us are like, that's not okay, and that's not normal, and not okay. However, according to Victorian standards, they were conventional. Photographs of nude children sometimes appeared on postcards or birthday cards, and nude portraits, skillfully done, were praised as art studies, as they were in the work of one of the contemporary photographers of the time. Victorians saw childhood as a state of grace. Even nude photographs of children were considered pictures of innocence itself. Now, is this true? I hate to say it, but yeah, it is true. Okay, why? I mean, okay, so during the Victorian era, it really hit home of a child's innocence, especially in England, because Queen Victoria was considered a child still when she took the throne at the age of 18. Okay. So for many people, even though she was beloved and, you know, brought England to a very prosperous period, everybody would kind of make comments to the extent of her losing her childhood innocence to become queen at such a young age. Okay. And you also have to remember that during the Victorian era, yes, there's many advancements in medicine and anatomy and, you know, all of that. So... Nude photographs were helpful in some respects to that, but when it came to children, it was more so of it still captured the innocence of a child. Okay. Because when I read that, I was just like, how is this real? Like, you know what I mean? Like, hey man, Victorian England was a time. Victorian England was a time. Let me tell you. But I mean, also on cards, they would be used as cards because think of it this way. Of, like, the baby angels, like, Mm -hmm. the naked baby angel pictures. Like, it's that same thing, Mm -hmm. only just with... Actual children. Actual, real-life children. Interesting. Well, I mean, so... I'm not condoning it. I'm just saying it was a thing. It was a thing, yeah. We don't condone this part of history. I can't say that it makes sense to me, but also, I am not from that time. It is not something that I personally understand. So, I recognize that. Now, because of him doing these pictures, I think that's led to a lot of people speculating, you know, that he kind of preyed on children, but there was never really any evidence to support it. Like, there wasn't really anything that I could find from, like, Alice Little or any of the other Littles specifically. Essentially, there was just a lot of speculation that he had this strange relationship with children, but at the same time, I can't say one way or the other. Do you have any opinions? I'm trying to think, and my brain is just not. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, like, there are people that are just like, well, if you look at Alice's adventures through Wonderland, it's like this, it's this whole metaphor, like, there's, like, Freudian things to it, and it's this whole metaphor. Okay, hold up. Freud, everybody needs to back away with all the Freudian stuff, because Freud was nuts, he did drugs, he was mentally insane. Yeah. Like, (laughs) if you look at his theories, they're weird and don't make much sense. Some of them do. Some of them do. And then some of them are just like, no. Yeah, some do, some don't. It's, It's a very mixed bag when it comes to Freud. But like, 
I don't know. It's one of those things where it's like, if you look at it from today's lens, you're just kind of like, oh, that's sketchy. If you look at it from the Victorian lens, there might be logical explanations for just about everything. But like, he never really wrote down anything like in journals or anything like that. So like, I don't know. Part of me is like, that's also kind of sketchy because if it's on the up and up, why wouldn't you find any accounts? But also, you know what I mean? Like, it's very hard for me to be like one way or the other. But you also have to remember this was the Victorian era where they did like take pictures of the dead and they did like pose the dead as if they were still living and took pictures of them. So they were weird. Yeah, Victorians, man, they're just, they're a crazy bunch. (laughs) It was weird. They had a fascination with death. Yes. And so, children. Yeah. So, like, they had... It, it was weird. And I I get kind of why people would look at, like, Alice now and, like, you know, think it's a kind of weird story. But at the end of the day, it's still a children's story. Like, take mm-hmm. it for what it is. Don't try to dig deeper. It's a children's story. Yeah. And I mean, again, I... I don't know. I I kind of came up more scratching my head with this one cuz it just I don't know. It, it you get some conflicting accounts and then it's kind of like what do you take? What do you believe? You know what I mean? And it's very much uh, yeah, I just kind of did my best when when looking up about his life, you know, and trying to find out information about that and trying to find reputable sources and you know, that kind of thing, which it was an interesting time researching this. It really was. Who would you rather deal with, Carol or Poe? I know my answer. I think Poe. Oh, you take Poe? I think so. I think I would take a very depressed man that can't drink alcohol. Honestly, I would take Poe too because I feel like I can overpower Poe. <laughs> Like I Carol, think I could take him. Carol, well, Dodson, Carol, who, however you want to call him, like he just there's too many unknowns. There's too many unknowns, and I am small human and look like a twelve year old. So like I could take Poe, no problem. Give him a glass of something, alcoholic, and uh, I I could handle him. <laughs> Yeah, I I don't know. It was interesting. It was interesting trying to research this and trying to find this, you know, trying to find it out. But like I said, there's not a lot of reputable sources. Doesn't mean that, you know, you can't be suspicious. But at the same time, you would think that if something happened, like especially like Alice Little or one of the other little children would say something. Yeah, and, like, you would think they would, but, like, he was even a friend of their family. Like, he was yeah, friends with he their was, dad. Yeah, he was a and friend like, of the family. none of them had anything bad to say. So, like... I mean, there was a thing that did report that he kind of stopped coming around, but and there's no, but there's no reason as to why. Okay, I kind of get that on why that would be questionable. However, at the same time, people grow and people change people don't no longer will see eye to eye on things again like a lot of what carol did is what a lot of other bachelors of the time did they were uncles to their friend's children doesn't necessarily mean that something sketchy was going on doesn't mean there wasn't but like i was having a hard time finding any sort of reputable sources to talk about what exactly was going on yeah i would he's fine it's probably fine (laughs) we say that we say that now and we'll never know and that's the thing it's something that's been lost to history we will never know the actual truth because there's no surviving records of it or anything like that you only have certain bits and pieces and if you look at them in a certain light doesn't look good if you look at it in another light it looks okay And maybe the truth is actually somewhere in the middle. You know, you never know. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that about does it for today's episode. We want to thank you very much as you came along as we talked about Lewis Carroll and his life and everything that kind of went along with that. If you like the episode, if you like what you're listening to, please consider sharing the episode with your friends. It really does help us to grow the show and we would be appreciative of that. Now, what are we going to be talking about next time? 
a battery telling of Edgar Allan Poe. Okay. So we will see you guys then. Bye. Bye.